Welcome to the Resilient Retail Game Plan, a podcast for anyone wanting to start, grow or scale a profitable creative product business with me, Catherine Erdley. The Resilient Retail Game Plan is a podcast dedicated to one thing, breaking down the concepts and tools that I've gathered from 20 years in the retail industry and showing you how you can use them in your business. This is the real nuts and bolts of running a successful product business, broken down in an easy, accessible way. This is not a podcast about learning how to make your business look good. It's the tools and techniques that will make you and your business feel good, confidently plan, launch and manage your products, and feel in control of your sales numbers and cash flow to help you build a resilient retail business. Welcome. It is episode number 83 of the Resilient Retail Game Plan. My name is Catherine Erdley and I'm your host as well as the founder of the Resilient Retail Club, which is my membership group for product businesses. You can find out more at resilientretailclub.com. Today, I have a very special guest. I am joined by Tamor Atigechi. And Tamor is the founder of the stationery company Papier, which some of you may have heard of. And Papier recently raised investment to back their expansion in the US. And Tamor talks in this episode about their ambitions, about how they really want to be category-defining, personalized stationary brand, as well as talking about the power of collaborations. I was really interested to hear what Tamor said about how his business uses collaborations, because it's something that I feel like I talk about a lot as a way of growing your brand. And it was really great to hear how Tamor used it to accelerate his business forward. Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, it's so exciting to hear about your plans for US expansion. So do you want to just kick us off by telling anyone who might not have heard of Papier, which I hard to believe there'd be that many people, but do you want to start off by telling us a little bit more about you and your business? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Tamo. I'm the founder of Papier, which is papier.com. We are on a mission to create a global category defining stationary brand. And so if you are either a user or don't know Papier, that means we do sell stationery. We are a stationer. We are direct to consumer. That means we sell everything directly via our own site. We are famous for our design and we collaborate with the likes of the VNA, big fashion designers like Alice Templey. The other big part that everyone knows us for is also personalization. We produce all our products on demand and that means you can personalize all of them as well. It's fantastic. And I was going to ask you about that personalization piece, because obviously you're a fast growing company. I think mm. the start I'd read was you know, basically doubled in size every year since you started in 2015. How much do you think personalization has been behind that? Personalization is an important part of the mix. I think you know, when we speak to customers about why they shop Papier, it certainly comes up in the top three reasons that they do that. And that's for, for a few reasons. I think one is gifting. I think people do tend to gift stationery as well as buy for themselves Uh, and personalizing it, making it unique and therefore quite thoughtful. It is a big part of that. So it's certainly been a way in which we've managed to kind of differentiate, especially from a retailer for whom obviously selling stock products is harder to enable that degree of personalization. Yeah, for sure. I think I mentioned before we started recording, I worked for Paper Chase for a few years and I think what's so interesting about your model is is you're almost flipping the traditional supply chain on its head because typically you'd be purchasing a stock product and then looking to personalize it, but you effectively are are purchasing in the elements to make a whole variety of products and then manufacturing them on demand. Yeah, exactly. So our our operating model or manufacturing model is, is completely different to most retailers. We are primarily producing these products, as you say, on demand, which effectively means the point in which the customer buys that product and clicks purchase is the point to which it gets rooted in to our manufacturing sites and is shipped straight off effectively the factory line. So that's how we can A, be very agile and enable personalization. It's also how we can be so sustainable in the way we produce our products. We're not shipping large amounts of products across overseas and we're only producing what the customer needs. Yeah, that's huge, especially in the days of, I mean, I know it's the fashion industry, but the the whole kind of collective horror that everyone experienced when they hear about fast fashion brands burning excess stock and this sort of thing and yeah what you're talking about here is such an agile model so that you can literally make what the customer needs exactly 
So plans for US expansion, which is really exciting. One thing I wanted to pick up was when you were talking about the expansion and sort of why now, you were talking about the move to analogue. So how people are embracing analogue pursuits like journaling, sort of embracing the offline life, if you like. So is that, do you think one of the reasons why now is a good time to go for the US market? Yeah, I I mean, the the trend towards analog or the analog movement in general has been gathering pace for a while. And the US is definitely seeing that big push towards a whole range of consumers, but younger consumers in particular, looking to limit the amount of digital they consume and digital that they, they publish and they use to read and actually try and balance that with analog. And it's primarily in pursuit of living a more rounded and well lifestyle. So yeah, that's we, we certainly have seen that trend. We've been in the US for, for a couple of years now, by, by which I mean we've been selling our product there. Mm-hmm. The, what we're doing now, which is so different, is actually moving the business, more of the business there. So that means right. more of our teams are going to be based out in, in the States. We've opened an office in New York. So really, that is going to mark a step change in how much attention and focus we're able to deliver to the paper people out in the States. And then will you have production capabilities in the US as well? Yeah, we, we do. And that's something we have had. Mm. It's something we're going to grow. We're going to add the number of sites. We're going to add the number of options people have in order to get their products as quickly as possible as well. But yeah, this is another step towards further localizing the business to the US customer. And of course, one of your big selling points, as you said at the beginning, is really the design element. And you've already started selling to the US, so you've no doubt got the data behind what the US customer is liking versus the UK customer. Are you seeing a difference in the type of design handwriting that's really speaking to the US customer? There are nuances, yeah. I think the way we often talk about it is, you know, the the, the brand has a kind of universal product, but it has local flavors. And, mm. and we certainly see that across the different markets, whether it's certain colors that trend, whether it's certain prints and patterns that trend in different parts of the US. So there are nuances, but actually there aren't big gulfs and differences. It's not as if there are whole swathes of our catalog <laughs> that, that, are, that don't appeal. But yeah, you certainly see those nuances between UK and US and even within the US, the different states as well. For sure. Yes. Uh, I worked in the US. I, I worked there for about five or six years, actually, and I worked for a clothing company. And what was so interesting, it was the, the nuances about, I'm sure it's not quite the same with stationery, but like the nuances with weather were so fascinating that, that you could have the Texas market buying their shorts like four months before the main market, for example. It's, I think that with the US, it's like multiple countries almost in one, the size of it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the thing um, everyone always talks about when whenever a brand moves to the US and starts to really grow in the US is is it takes a while to really get your head around the size of that market. And actually, yeah. to your point, the fact that really it is like having lots of UK sized territories uh, in one big continent. And so that is incredible from a commercial element because you have such a huge market. And, and in the case of the US, masses of people who absolutely love stationery. But it yes. does also mean you do have to take a somewhat local approach even within the US between states as well. Yes, totally, for sure. But again, with your model being print on, effectively print on demand, make on demand, then that must really help as well, right? Because then you can put it, put it out there and then learn about the nuances. It's not like you're actually physically having to ship out to different states. Totally. Which is, <laughs> was my role, shipping coats around the country and trying to catch the weather patterns. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're totally right. The on-demand model has definitely got real benefits in it in the ability to you to kind of have a test and learn approach. And we are, you know, we are a startup with six and a half years old. Test yeah. and learn is is something that's part of any startup's DNA. With with the world of stock, test and learn is hard because if yeah. you purchase a thousand items and they sell really well, it's too late to to place another order and you have to wait another six months for them to to dial up. Whereas with our model, we have, you know, in any given category, over 100 different designs and prints, and those have unlimited stock effectively. And so we're not having to place a bet on what's going to sell or what's not going to sell and let the consumer dictate that and the operation can scale accordingly. Very exciting. Talking then a little bit about some of your designs, because I know that you have major partnerships. So, for example, you mentioned the B&A. 
obviously the VNA has an uncertain amount of international recognition, but do you think that going forward you'll be looking to partner with some US specific designers, uh, institutions to kind of get maybe more US focused brand partnerships? Definitely, yeah. We, we, I mean, we have brought on partners uh, over the past year, Rosie Asseline the fashion designer in New York, Mm -hmm. but we specifically are going to be targeting and partnering with um, artists, institutions. There are a number of conversations already underway. By way of our team, we've moved a lot of our kind of brand and partnerships capability and team over to New York. They've moved there physically to really be able to double down on on growing our, our partnership capability out there. So it's a big part of the Papier model, would you say? It is. It's a big part of the Papier model in the way we design and produce our products. It's also a big part of the brand DNA. The Papier brand has always been, on the one hand, kind of has its own creativity, its own handwriting and its own design DNA. But on the other hand, was always about partnering and kind of enabling creativity by by doing these collaborations. And you know, collaborations are now you know, so vast and it's become the flavor of every brand. uh, It's been something we've done from the outset that we've always loved being able to bring two different creatives together and seeing kind of what comes out of that. I mean, that must be exciting in a way to see how it's taken off over time. But of course, it's a certain extent, as you said, it's it's built into the DNA of the company. It's something that you've done from the get-go, maybe even before other people were doing it. And do you think that that is something that you see more as a way of sort of customer acquisition to get in front of a new audience? Or do you see partnerships as a way of building customer loyalty because you're always offering your existing customers something new and different? Or is it a little bit of both? It is a bit of both. And actually, the two you mentioned exactly how we think about it. By by using these, these partnerships, we're able to kind of get the Papier brand in front of audiences that maybe haven't thought about us or maybe even haven't thought about stationery as a category. Mm. So when we partner with institutions like the VNA, we're obviously in front of a customer and audience that loves art, that loves design. And many of those obviously love stationery. And when, when we partner with fashion designers, it's quite a different audience in some ways. And it's ones that are loyal to that designer, but actually then can see Papier. So, so that's from, an, from a customer acquisition perspective, it's an, and actually a brand awareness perspective, it's a very key strategy. And then from a retention perspective, again, as well, it means that we can always be coming up with and producing new things for, the, for our customer base, actually show them designers that maybe they, they hadn't considered before. Mm. And in that respect, always be at the forefront of stationary design uh, overall and kind of be leading the curve when it comes to kind of what is cool, what's on trend, what's actually interesting in the market they're almost able to go to you to see what's new and what's interesting. It's, you're almost curating design for them. Definitely. It's, and, and it's always been our intention that Papi acts you know, as a curator in that respect. It's not an open marketplace. There are, way, there are other companies and places where you can just go through tens of thousands of designs mm. by tens of thousands of independent artists. We think actually the consumer increasingly wants less choice. They do want a degree of curation, and that's that's where we come in. We only partner with you know the leading designers and artists who are at the forefront of their individual field, and that's who we collaborate with and bring their creativity to stationery. Right, I love that. The consumer wants less choice. Is that that paradox of choice when you've got endless ability to scroll, but you actually want to see? You want to you want a point of view, right? You want uh, an opinion about what what you should be looking at, what you should be purchasing. Definitely, yeah, definitely. I think we are all increasingly short of time, short of attention. Our attention spans have got shorter and shorter. So what we don't want is to have to, as you say, kind of doom scroll through thousands and thousands of products. Um, that's that's not really where customers want to be right now. And I was going to say as well, when you mentioned returning customers, I mean, I, I know from my experience in the stationery industry, I don't know whether it's something about the product or what it is, but stationery fans, like they're very dedicated. Do you, I'm sure you find that yourself over six and a half years, you must have built up some real diehard Papier fans. Yeah, stationery is, is one of those wonderful and amazing categories where people have very strong views about the value of it and you know whether it's how it makes them feel if they're using a diary or a notebook before bed 
whether it's the impact of receiving a thank you card that's handwritten versus an email. I think people have very strong emotional opinions about it. And that in itself creates this very engaged community of, as we call them, paper people, people who really do <laughs> love the feeling yeah. of, of pen to paper, who love, who love everything about that. Yeah. And, and that's what Papier has been built on. It's been built on that community of people who are stationary addicts as well. Yes. And then the paper itself becomes very important, right? The, the GSM, the, the, the feel of it, the, the ability to write without the ink bleeding through. I'm sure you have lots of people with lots of opinions about that too. Lots of opinions, um, <laughs> not always possible to satisfy everyone. Is, um, you know, whether you are someone who likes thick paper that doesn't bleed through or wants a kind of really light featherweight paper, mm. you know, that's that's definitely a lot of the debate that goes on inside Maison Papier. <laughs> that I have to say, I love those kind of debates. As a stationary addict myself, that sounds like my ideal kind of conversation. Good. So, <laughs> As a stationary addict your, yourself, I know, I know that obviously one of the, the ideas behind raising funding is obviously the US expansion, but then also product expansion. Do you have sort of a dream list of, of categories or types of products that you'd love to see? I mean, I always have wish lists and excited by shiny opportunities and <laughs> categories and products. But one of the nice things about the business as it grows is, is I increasingly hire people that are much better at making those judgments and decisions. So we have buyers and designers and design director that all together kind of come up with what we should be thinking about, what products we should be launching. And that's going to materialize later on this year. We are going from primarily being a, a company that has stationary products that are paper to mm. being a product a stationary business that has a whole array of stationary products for your desk. So that will include everything from writing to utensils through to desk storage. Uh, and that's all going to be launching later on this year um, in the summer. That's something I'm massively excited about. So it's sort of a one-stop shop almost for all of your, your stationary needs. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, when we spoke to our customers, about 70% of them said that the main reason they didn't come more often and shop at Papier is because we didn't offer some of the products, the stationary products that they needed and they wanted. So yeah, it, it, exactly as you say, to be category defining, we need to be a destination that serves all stationary needs, uh, whether that's the highlighter pen, the sticky note, the, the pen, uh, all of those wonderful things that you know I know someone like you or me cannot live without <laughs> uh, needs to be sold at Papier. Yes. So just finally, to wrap things up, I, I guess I just had a question going back to this idea of analog. Do you think that we will see more people embracing this analog lifestyle? Do you think that we'll continue to have more people becoming aware of maybe the impact of spending too much time online or the move towards more digital? Do you think that we'll see this grow or do you think it will always be almost like a subsection of people who really want to keep that analog feel? No, I think it's accelerating and it's becoming quite mainstream in the sense that, you know, the awareness of the psychological behavioral impacts of our consumption of digital and our exposure to digital is just something that people readily and always talk about. And actually, in some ways, you know, the, the pandemic and obviously now this, this move towards more remote working is making people acutely aware of the amount of times any given week people say things like, I'm zoomed out or I just, you know, I'm just sick of staring at my screen. There is a real common understanding now that actually there comes points where you don't want to be engaged and plugged in the whole time. And so I think what you are seeing then is this, this at the same time, the growth in the counterbalance to that weight, mm. which is analog grow, is people actually say, you know what, I'm not going to use my phone or my laptop to do this, to, to write this piece of work or whatever. I'm going to use a notebook or I'm going to use a journal. So you are seeing it, it is in a way a counterbalance or a counter movement, which is only going to grow as digital grows in our lives. At Papi, I always say anti-digital or Luddites, we are a digitally native direct-to-consumer company, but we strongly believe in the power of, of, of analog. And actually, we use digital and the ease, the convenience, there's so much that's great about, that, about it to allow people to shop and behave and live a more analog lifestyle through that. So, so that's it is all about balance. And I think if anything, you know, the, the pandemic is really pushing us to really think about that. The balance between work and personal, the balance between the office and home. And you know, for us, it's a big balance between how much you do analog with 
with pen, with paper and, and the benefits that that has on your mental health and the way you think and feel versus how much time you spend staring at the screen. Thank you so much for listening and thank you so much to Tamil for your time to join us for today's episode. I'm sure it's a very busy time right now for Papier getting ready for the US expansion, but it was really fascinating to hear all about Tamil's plans for the brand and how they've grown over the years, which is really interesting to hear his insight. Why not come over and see me on Instagram at Resilient Retail Club? You can also find Papier at Papier on Instagram or go to papier.com to take a look at their full range of beautiful personalized stationery. Tell me what your takeaways were. And of course, if you have a moment to rate and review, it makes such a difference. And of course, if you hit subscribe or follow the podcast, you'll be the first to know about every new episode. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, then I invite you to check out resilientretailclub.com. The Resilient Retail Club is the membership for anyone wanting to start, grow or scale a profitable product business. No more trawling Google trying to find the answers to your questions or wading through general business advice that speaks mainly to service-based businesses. Whether you're still at the idea stage or you've been going for a while but want to get more focused and organised when it comes to your business, the Resilient Retail Club is the place for you. With a library of courses tailored to creative product businesses, several live sessions a month and a supportive and active community, the Resilient Retail Club is the perfect membership to help you hit your goals faster. Check it out at resilientretailclub.com.